Hi, everyone. I'm Raj Kumar, president and editor-in-chief of DevX. This week, we'll be breaking down the big headlines in global development and bringing in some top experts to help us do it. If you want to follow along with the stories we're talking about, check out devx.com and subscribe to our daily newsletter, The Newswire. There's a link in the description. Follow us along on Twitter, and you can see many of the stories we're talking about today. And we'd love to hear what you think. This is This Week in Global Development. I'm Anna Gavell, DevX's managing editor, uh, filling in for our editor in chief, Raj Kumar, this week. Um, and I'm joined by my colleague, Colm. Colm helps cover the UN general, the UN for us. And as many of you know, next week is the UN General Assembly, the uh, so called Super Bowl for global development, if you will. So we've decided to dedicate uh, this week's episode to anything and everything UNGA related. Uh, we've got a lot to unpack. So let's go ahead and dive in. Um, now, Colm, you are a seasoned veteran, having been, having survived, I should say many a general assembly. Um, to begin with, uh, what are some of the main things that you're keeping an eye out on next week? So I, you mentioned sort of the Super Bowl of, you know, uh, of diplomatic sort of issues involving development. But like for much of the last few decades, it's really that the, the issues that really captured the world's imagination have been security issues, uh, wars in Syria, uh, the genocide in Rwanda, in the Balkans, um, conflict now in Ukraine. But, but development has been an issue, particularly for the global south, that's been at the front and center of their issues. And has there's been a feeling that they haven't been, that they've given been given short shrift in the past on these General Assembly meetings. This year, which is the mid-level, uh, the mid-term for the, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, which were established by world leaders in 2015, to try and reach a whole series of goals to improve the, the condition of, uh, you know, the quality of life for people across the world to, uh, there are 17 goals, including trying to eradicate poverty and trying to sort of improve the, you know, save the environment and, you know, improve food security and a whole range of other issues. Um, so this was supposed to be the year that the UN General Assembly was really going to be focused 100% on development. Um, there's a big summit on Monday and Tuesday, the 18th and 19th, hosted by the Secretary General. Um, you know, world leaders from across the globe are coming. And um, one of the world leaders who's coming, it'll be his first visit, is, um, is President Zelensky from Ukraine. And there's some um, concern about whether his... Um, visit is going to sort of suck all of the oxygen out of the air. Um, the uh, the United States and other key powers are very much trying to use the session to um, increase political pressure on Russia to reverse its uh, invasion of Ukraine and to step down. And it will try to, um, you know, encourage a whole range of countries to get behind the U.S. and the Europeans and to get behind Ukraine. Um, but there's sort of a concern that, you know, that, that, that the focus should be more on development and less on the war in uh, Ukraine. Um, there's a lot of sympathy for the Ukrainian position, but there's also concern that over the last several years, particularly since the pandemic, uh, that, um, that uh, the global south is enduring um, extreme hardships. Um, you know, they had troubles getting vaccines during the first years of the, the pandemic. Um, they're facing enormous soaring uh, debt servicing levels. Um, uh, you're seeing, you know, at the, you know, in the advance of every UN General Assembly, you see some sort of apocalyptic, um, you know, uh, humanitarian disaster. Uh, you saw the floods last year in Pakistan covering a third of the country. You have... Uh, massive floods and the, uh, the 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 breaking of dams in Libya, with thousands of people killed, and so you know there's going to be sort of certain tension over you know what are we going to focus on, right? And so um, so the developing nations, the global south, have made it clear that this is the time to remain focused on these issues. Um, the security issues are important, but these issues are becoming more and more of a burden every day, and they're existential burdens for them. Now, you mentioned the, the 17 SDGs. There's going to be a big event um, summit on Monday and Tuesday. 
what are you expecting? I mean, there's going to be, like you said, from from Libya to, to climate change, uh, debt relief. What are you expecting to be some of the main topics of discussion? And do you think anything concrete will come out of it or just rhetoric about turning rhetoric into action, if you will? So um, there have been over the last couple of months, there have been intense closed door negotiations in New York to, to draft a declaration that world leaders will um, will will adopt um, on Monday, uh, the first day of the session, and that will say all the right things. It will res- it will reflect deep frustration that the um, that the sustainable development goals that were set back in 2015. Uh, have been backsliding that, um, you know, you know, the most important one is sort of ending extreme poverty by 2030. And sort of we've seen since 2020, we've seen an additional 165 million people fall back into extreme poverty, which is, you know, measured by, um, you know, earnings, people who earn less than three, about three and a half dollars uh, per day. So um, there is concerns also about rising debt, um, that some countries are paying, you know, you know, twice as much for debt servicing as they do for their social programs. That will be high on the agenda. Um, but generally, they will have an agreed declaration. Um, there are some last issues that have to be resolved. A, a couple of, um, you know, states that have uh, been trying to, you know, add into the declaration language that would inhibit the ability of the United States and others to impose unilateral sanctions on countries. Um, but there is an expectation that they will give in at the end of the day. So everybody will play nice. It won't be a disaster. But if you kind of look at sort of what's been going on over the last um, couple of weeks, there have been some very deep divisions, um, particularly between uh, the U.S. and some of its closest allies, Japan, the United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, they have been concerned, I think, that the document that is going to be uh, adopted um, moves too quickly in terms of uh, sort of, ex- uh, of increasing commitments by industrial countries to, um, to come up with money to address a lot of these, um, these issues that are being faced by uh, the global south. Um, you know, issues like, you know, there's one a secretary general uh, proposal for a $500 billion a year sustainable development uh, stimulus um, fund. Um, the United States and its partners were kind of reluctant to let that through uh, and tried to sort of soften some of the language. So, so a lot of this has been going on behind the scenes. The U.S. also is not keen uh, about having the basic negotiations that, you know, everybody expects on um, the kind of, uh, you know, reform of the international financial architecture. Uh, The U.S. would prefer not to have these debates and negotiations in the United Nations General Assembly, where you have 193 countries, many of them developing countries who would have the equal vote with the United States. They prefer to have these discussions in the multilateral development banks like the World Bank, um, like the IMF, where they have, uh, they're more comfortable with the decision-making structure um, that they ha- they feel that they can exert more influence in those. So there's been a lot of tension over these issues. Uh, there's been certain tension over, um, you know, negotiations over what's called uh, the summit of the future. Um, there have been negotiations over uh, a document that will be adopted by uh, foreign ministers uh, next week on setting the stage for negotiations in the coming year on a major UN reform effort to try to deal with everything in terms of digital governance, um, you know, international reform of the financial system, uh, reform of the peace and security agenda. And so there's an expectation that these are going to be very, very difficult negotiations over the next year. Who are some of the other big names that you're keeping an eye out on and who are some of the big no-shows? The first, you know, member state leader that speaks traditionally is Brazil. And so Brazil will be interesting. Uh, President Lula, it'll be his first um, speech since he, you know, since he defeated uh, Bolsonaro. I mean, he, you know, was previously president and has spoken before. So um, there's, this is going to be a very important um, you know, 
way to sort of measure the degree of important states and how they are playing this balance between, you know, uh, maintaining good relations with the United States, which is, you know, in a very difficult confrontation with Russia and China, and to what degree a country like Brazil and Lula, who has been trying to kind of, who has been sort of reestablishing quite good relations with President Biden, visited him in Washington in February, but at the same time has been sending signals to President Putin and to President Xi in China that he wants good relations with them. So how is a country like Brazil, which is sort of trying to kind of walk, you know, a, a kind of very delicate tightrope, um, how are they going to sort of manage this effort to try and you know, to not be sort of, you know, to not be seen as falling too solidly on in one camp or the other. In the lead up to this um, General Assembly, uh, Lula made a very controversial remark about um, assuring that if, um, if, if, you know, if, if, if President Putin came to uh, Brazil next year for an important uh, meeting of world leaders, that uh, Brazil would not arrest him. Now, um, as many people know, President Putin has been charged uh, with, uh, with serious crimes in Ukraine, and uh, the International Criminal Court has issued an arrest warrant for him. So, you know, Brazil is a signatory to the ICC, and they should, by law, be required to turn him over um, to The Hague to face justice. Um, so he's backed off a bit from those remarks, but it sort of tells you what kind of, like, you know, the dilemma that he faces in trying to kind of, you know, maneuver between what's increasingly polarized world and a kind of what some people describe as a kind of a, a new Cold War between the U.S. and its allies on the one hand and China and Russia on the other. Um, so that'll be interesting. One of the really interesting issues is like who's not going to be here. So Pre President Biden, who is the... Uh, you know, who is the host of the meeting. It is, um, you know, uh, the U.S. presidents almost always show up for the event and uh, deliver the second speech, and, um, and President Biden will do that. But um, all the other major powers, the, what we call the permanent members of the Security Council, the big powers who have veto power in the Security Council, the United Kingdom, France, China, and Russia, none of those four countries are sending their leaders to this event. Um, you know, in, in some sense, I think this kind of reinforces a lot of the frustration that the global south feels where, you know, we're supposed to be really focused on development. Where are all the big powers and why are we, um, you know, and why are they not showing up for this event? Um, I think President Macron has decided that, you know, he has uh, scheduled meetings to uh, he's going to be meeting or hosting visits by uh, King Charles III and by um by uh, Pope Francis, so uh, so he's clearly felt that um, uh, that is more of a priority than the UN General Assembly this year. Don't you think this is a very strange snub? I mean, Russia and China aside, you know, I would think even if you're not interested in meeting members of the Global South, that, you know, you would take the opportunity if you're the UK and France to meet with Biden and meet with some of the other high level speakers that leaders that will be there. It just seems like such an odd snub to me. Not, not just Biden, but there is a real, you know, competition for hearts and mind right now over the war in Ukraine, over this whole geopolitical divide between the United States on the one hand and Russia and China on the others. And, and that, you know, competition for, you know, for hearts and minds involves the global South. And so this is a sort of wonderful opportunity for the Europeans to show that they care about these issues and for China and Russia to show. Now, President Putin, it's a little tricky for him because, you know, as I mentioned, there's an arrest warrant for him. Um, you know, under under the U.S. agreement with the United Nations, you know, he should be able to come to a U.N. event without being harassed or arrested. But, you know, that's probably a question that he doesn't want to have resolved at JFK um, you know, airport, right? So, and, and he doesn't come that often, and she doesn't come that often um, to, you know, to, to attend these events. Um, the French and the British do more frequently, but, you know, it's, it's um, you know, it's not unusual that French presidents, you know, have, have taken a pass. I mean, if you look at Angela Merkel in Germany, she used to hardly ever come to these uh, UN General Assembly events. I remember, you know, one time she really, you know, uh, decided to come, and she ended up, you know, mostly focused on the Sustainable Development Summit. Um, so, um, so I think it's not unusual, but 
you know, the, it's it's a sort of particular time when um, you know when you know when both sides really need to develop and cultivate that support, and it's sort of a missed opportunity. I mean, one of the things that's really interesting is that the Europeans, particularly in the EU members, and you know, uh, are you know one of their priorities coming to New York this week, and a priority that's going to continue throughout the year, is they want to spend time reaching out to delegations that they generally ignore. So small countries, small island states small countries in Africa, Asia, Latin America, they want to ins- ensure that they're giving them, that they're listening to them, that they're meeting with them. So that there have been a lot of conversations behind the scenes among European ministers that they need to sort of they need to upgrade their their contacts and relations with these with these with these governments. So countries like Micronesia and Burundi, uh, not necessarily the big emerging powers like you know India and Brazil, but, you know, smaller countries. Um, you know, the UN is, is in many ways, particularly the General Assembly, it's a numbers game, and you need to have big numbers. And so they need to do more work to try and build up broader alliances outside of their own kind of like-minded team. Hi, I'm Kate Warren, Executive Editor at DevEx. If you're listening to this podcast, you're likely working to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. But are you subscribed to DevEx Newswire? Global development can be a fast-moving, complex sector. Our team of global reporters work every day to bring you the news you need to make sense of it all. In DevEx Newswire, we keep you up to date on issues ranging from climate change financing to gender equality and global health to transforming the food system, all in a fun-to-read, free newsletter delivered directly to you five days a week. Join the hundreds of thousands of global development professionals who receive DevEx Newswire and visit devex.com slash newsletters to sign up to this free newsletter today. Now, you had briefly touched on this, but let's look ahead to to next year. Uh, you've got the 2024 Summit of the Future, uh, which is aimed at forging new global consens- consensus on what the future should look like and how to achieve it. Um, this too has already been marred uh, by acrimony, in part because some low to middle income countries say we should be focusing our energy on the current sustainable goals, which are already faltering, instead of looking ahead to to really have another future summit. Um, what are some of the objections you've been hearing in terms of this summit of the future and the draft declaration that's supposed to be coming out uh, this year? And what are your predictions for possibly overcoming these objections? So it's a massive um, reform effort, and there are a lot of different complicated issues. And um, and I think what we saw earlier this year was the Group of 77, which is the sort of alliance of actually more than 130 non-aligned countries, um, they issued a, a statement to the, you know, in, initially there were negotiations going on this year on the declaration um, for the future summit. And they sent a, a very sharp message to the negotiators that we want you to stop having these official sessions because we're concerned that it's diverting attention away from the sustainable development goals. And so, so they have backed off on that and and you know they agreed as a compromise that they would have like a ministerial meeting this year um, and that at that meeting they would have uh, a statement on the scope of the um, uh, you know on the scope of, uh, of the, you know the negotiations for the declaration but um, but the negotiations the the, the original um, declaration that is going to be adopted next week, Um, It was like four pages, had a lot of details on various elements that were going to be addressed. And, um, and, 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 you know, there's a sort of a diplomatic maneuver calling breaking silence. And what that means is that the negotiations, negotiators will have what they think is a potentially an agreed declaration, a document, they'll give it to all the member states. And if nobody says anything over a 24 or 48 hour period, then it's considered agreed by consensus. So in this case, there were six different sections of the, um, of the document that um, where there wasn't agreement and and and, the, and there were other issues where you know certain coalitions wanted in for, wanted uh, language in the report that wasn't there so you know there's a whole group of countries like 
you know, usually countries that are sort of, um, um, you know, considered in the U.S. rogue states. But, uh, you know, you'd have Belarus, you'd have uh, Eritrea, you'd have Syria, Iran, uh, Venezuela, countries like that demanding that um, that the uh, that the declaration include a prohibition on the use of unilateral coercive measures, which is, they call it, which just means, you know, sanctions. So basically they want to constrain the ability of the United States and others to impose bilateral sanctions on other countries. And so that language, you know, is never going to make it into these documents because the U.S. and, you know, other partners who support, you know, and think that sanctions are justified in certain cases are not accepted, are not acceptable. So, there, there were differences over the way that issues like, you know, the role of the UN dealing with international financial reform are handled, um, you know, a, a, whole range of, a whole range of issues where there's not agreement. And, and all of that, you know, portends a difficult year. In order to overcome this, um, the negotiators, the chief negotiators have essentially um, come up with a very streamlined um, uh, declaration that you know takes out all of the most controversial or disputed uh, issues and sort of kicks the can down the road. So that's that's where we are now. So all these tough issues are going to have to be hammered out over the next year. So following up on the summit of the future, uh, Secretary General has talked about striking a digital compact that would, in the words of his tech envoy, um, set the rules of the road that can guide governments through. The future of AI. Um, this story's just come out today. I love how you wrote that the Secretary General has tried to uh, quote offer up the world body as a safe harbor from an unruly digital future plagued by sentient killer, killer robots and intrusive spyware. So sounds very omin- ominous. But um, I mean, how realistic is this kind of compact, and what are the dangers of trying to? regulate the dangers of AI, if you will? So I think there, you know, there is a feeling in the United States, as in in the United Nations, as there is in the United States, as there is many other governments, that sort of AI is accelerating at a rate that um, is beyond, has kind of gone beyond uh, the capacity of state institutions to govern to manage and uh and and everyone is grappling with this now the un is not a place that has you know deep um knowledge and experience uh on and technical ability um to deal with these issues but there's also i think a feeling both by member states but also you know by the tech industry by civil society that the un probably does have a significant role in setting up some sort of guardrails and but the question is 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 you know how how does that evolve and are there risks with having the UN play that role so some observers you know see the UN as a state centric organization you know where member states you know hold all the cards and and have a history of trying to sideline civil society players and and others and and so you know there are there there are suspicions or skepticism about you know the UN's ability to um, to pursue um, legislation, resolutions, treaties that um, would set guardrails that didn't impinge on issues of free speech, that didn't uh, reinforce the state power to use um, uh, this technology to surveil their populations, to control their populations. So, you know, there's a concern. There are a lot of countries like China and Russia and others, Turkey, who have, you know, used technology and manipulated in ways that that seek to, um, you know, to limit the scope of, of their citizens' freedom, and there's a concern that they will have an influence over any, you know, state, you know, intergovernmental negotiations. So there's a concern about that. Uh, there's other concerns on the other side, which is that, um, you know, the pace of technology is advancing so quickly that there's a risk that, you know, the UN and member states don't move quickly enough to regulate it. So I think it's going to be a whole complicated issue. Um, 
you know, that they're going to have to grapple with. And then there's, you know, there's also, you know, the UN is a quite fragmented organization. So, you know, you have UNESCO is developing ethics guidelines for, you know, AI. Um, human rights, the Office of, you know, the High Commissioner of Human Rights, they're working on trying to deal with human rights related issues and, and the internet. Um, the Secretary General has, you know, a tech envoy who has sort of a broad mandate to try and help coordinate what's going on with the UN system. Them. The International Telecommun Telecommunications Union uh, has, you know, some role in setting standards. So, so, and and they're all kind of like sort of quasi independent fiefdoms, and it's not clear whether you know how effectively the UN system is in kind of bringing all this, unifying all this work. And I think that's going to be a major challenge is to sort of to provide some coherence in the way that they address these issues. So. To wrap up, since this is not your first uh, rodeo when it comes to the UN General Assembly, what are some of like, are there any particular memories or uh, striking changes that you've seen happen over the years? Well, I can tell you one frustration I have, which is that every year uh, up until the pandemic, there would be a luncheon that involved all the world leaders. And so you would see, you know, you basically, you know, you'd have, um, you know, I, mean, I remember when there was talk about President Obama trying to set up a meeting with President Rouhani in Iran over restarting negotiations over Iran nuclear deal. And, um, you know, the expectation was that they would meet, you know, they would sort of cross one another's paths at the luncheon and, and you know, shake hands. So everybody was waiting for that. But then at the end, Rouhani didn't come because they served alcohol at the event and it couldn't be an event where they were serving alcohol. <laughs> and so they eventually had the, you know, they eventually sort of connected by telephone and they did pursue the negotiations, which ultimately, um, you know, resulted in the Iran nuclear deal, which has since uh, been unraveled by, you know, the, uh, by the Trump administration. But you had that. I remember uh, when President Trump came, there was a sort of amusing, you know, I mean, we could, you know, I was in the room and you could also watch it on video. You could see, you know, he had a very di difficult relationship with the former chancellor, uh, German chancellor, Angela Merkel. And you could see her trying to avoid him by walking behind his chair so she didn't have to have like an awkward exchange as she often does with him. Um, you know, you had issues in the past where, you know, uh, you know, uh, President uh, Clinton's, you know, restarted uh, diplomatic talks with the um, with the Sudanese following, you know, an exchange at the luncheon. So those, you know, those were suspended during the pandemic, you know, for obvious reasons. But they, they, they you know, they uh, seem to be discontinuing. It's not happening now. Um, uh, you know, so that's kind of frustrating. That was always like, it was really an amazing thing to watch. You would have all these world leaders that you wouldn't expect crossing paths, you know, looking at each other, shaking hands, avoiding each other, mostly avoiding each other. But, um, but that was always fun. So we won't, we won't have that anymore. Well, we'll definitely cross paths because I'll yeah. I'll be in New York and and I can hear the the joys of the traffic, the the sounds of the car horns in the background. So I'm very excited for the traffic, but I am genuinely excited um, to be seeing you. And we'll be hosting our own DevX events next Wednesday and Thursday. And we've also got a lot more from Column, uh, a lot more analysis and scoops to come next week. That includes a special UNGA opener newsletter next Monday, as well as a wrap-up edition the following Monday. So be sure to go to devx.com to register for the Newswire um, to get those special editions as well as our daily uh, daily coverage of UNGA next week. And also next week, the episode will be coming to you, our episode here, This Week in Global Development, will be coming to you straight from UNGA. So be sure to follow our Twitter page for the latest updates. In the meantime, thanks, Colin, for joining us. And thank you, everyone else, for joining us as well. And we will see you next week in New York. Thanks, Anna. Look forward to seeing you. Take care. Take care. This has been This Week in Global Development. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe using the link in the description. To get even more coverage and analysis on the most pressing development issues of the day, become a DevX Pro member by going to devx.com membership and signing up. Thank you for listening and see you next week.